who is uh, being given the Pro Bono Lawyer of the Year Award. And I guess, Mark, why don't you just start and introduce yourself to us? Well, I'm Mark Bennett. <laughs> and Mark, where are you from? I'm from Houston. Uh, born and raised? I grew up overseas. My dad was CIA, so we lived all over the place when I was a kid. We lived in Thailand, Germany. I went to high school in India. And then I came back to Houston, because dad was from Houston. I came back to Houston to go to Rice, and it just stuck. It became home. Wow, wow. So you, uh, where'd you finish or graduate from college? Graduated from Rice, and then went to University of Houston Law Center. What was your degree in at Rice? My, my degree at Rice was in religious studies. Religious studies, wow. How did you get from religious studies into law? Before I started in religious studies, I knew I wanted to be a lawyer. And so it was just a liberal arts degree to get me into law school. I actually started as a political science major and realized that I wasn't enjoying that. I didn't like thinking about the political science. I didn't like the reading. I didn't like the classes. But I had taken some religious studies classes, so I switched over and found that I enjoyed that more. That's amazing. So when you started at U of H Law, what year was it? It was 1992. Okay, and you graduated when? So I graduated from U of H in 1995. And when you were in law school, did you always know you wanted to be a criminal lawyer, or what was kind of your focus in law school? When I started law school, I knew I wanted to be a criminal defense lawyer. And my first year at criminal law prof convinced me that that was not the case. She made the subject matter boring, she was a terrible teacher, she wasn't responsive to questions. And I figured, man, I thought criminal law would be interesting, but if it's really like this, then I don't want to do that. I'll go be a civil lawyer and make bundles of money. Okay, so what did you do when you got out of law school? Well, so I, I got back on track before the end of law school is the, the end of the story because uh, after my first year in law school, I had a clerkship. That was fun, civil firm. After my second year of law school, I had two at civil litigation and bankruptcy firms. And I looked around and nobody was having any fun. And so I started asking the associates at these firms, hey, are you having any fun? And I never got a straight yes answer. It was always, well, it's a job. Job's not supposed to be fun. It's got its ups and its downs. And I figured if, if I'm not going to be having fun, I don't want to do it. So third year of law school, I got back on track to do criminal law. I took Jim Skelton's criminal law clinic uh, at U of H and got narrowed in on what I wanted to do and then did it when I got out. All right, so what did you do when you got out? Started my practice. You just hung a shingle, didn't go to the DA's office? Did not go to the DA's office, didn't have partners, just, just hung a shingle, doing door law at first, whatever came in the door, whatever it took to keep the doors open, I would do. So I did family law and probate law and tried a personal injury lawsuit. But what I really wanted to do was criminal law. Within a couple of years, I was able to narrow it down, so I was only doing criminal defense. Okay, so you've been practicing how many years now? 20. 20. 20. Just had my 20-year anniversary. All right, so where is your practice now? What, do you, what would you be your focus, or where is your practice now? General criminal practice. I don't take a lot of DWIs because of the specialization required to do them now that almost every case is a blood draw case. I've never, I've, I've learned about the blood draw technology, but never gotten it to the point where I'm confident that I could try one of those cases without learning a lot more. And it's not worth most clients' money to, uh, for me to get up to speed to be able to try a blood draw case as well as you could, right? right? You, know, you could do it in your sleep, and, and I would have to stay awake a few nights and, and learn a whole lot more before I could do it. So after 20 years, how else are you involved? I know you're, you're past president of HCCLA. You're still heavily involved with HCCLA. What else are you involved with? Trial lawyers college? So, so right. So I, uh, I've been the vice president of the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association four times now. I've been the president once. I've been on the board for several years. I am, I'm not on the board and I'm not an officer now. I'm trying to back off and let the, the younger people run the organization. Uh, I went to the Trial Lawyers College in 1999. I'm not active with the, the Trial Lawyers College. Um, I do a lot of psychodrama training, but as far as organizations go, I've, I've never been really much of a one to join an organization. I don't, I, I don't play well with others that way. <laughs> All right, well, what do you, and I think it's fascinating what you do with your free time. What are you involved in right now? to outside of the office, you know? Right, so, so right now, outside of the practice, I'm, I do a lot of improv. Yeah. I do improvisational theater. So uh, two, three, sometimes four nights a week, I'll either have an improv practice or a class or actually do a show. I can't stay at Rusty Duncan because Friday night I have a show at Station Theater in Houston. So we're gonna go do live improvised theater. A lot of people think here improv and think comedy because there are the comedy clubs called the improv. Right. But improv is not, it's not comedy. It can be funny and, and often, usually, probably it is funny, but improv is just theater. It's just it's it finding a story and telling the truth. And telling the truth is usually funny. It usually winds up being funny. You think that improv helps your legal career and your legal career actually helps your improv? 
absolutely improv helps my legal career. Does my legal career help my improv? I don't know. I think a lot of what we learn in law school and what we do every day stifles us, stifles our creativity, right? Because we get into tracks of, okay, this is how we have to think about these things. So I don't, I mean, I, I don't think that being a lawyer helps me be a better improviser. I, I know that being an improviser helps me being a lawyer. Okay. It helps me being a better lawyer because it, it opens me up. It, it, it activates my creativity. Okay. Well, so now that we've discussed you, let's get back on track with the uh, why you're. How did you get involved in? Well, not. Let me start over with that. Why did you choose? Why do you have so much? Let me actually. Let me start over. Are you having fun at your job? I am having fun at my job. That's right. Right. So, so when I was in my uh, clerkships after my second year of law school, I looked around and nobody was having any fun. And I'd ask them, "Is this job fun?" Nobody ever gave me this answer, which is, "Hell yes, I'm having yes. fun. I love this job." Right. And if you won the lottery, what would you do? I would keep doing this job. <laughs> that's, a, that's awesome. All right. So, um, the pro bono award that you're getting is in relation to what kind of cases? First Amendment cases. Like freedom of speech? Freedom of speech cases, yes. All right, so let's break down the freedom of speech. What kind of cases specifically with freedom of speech? So I discovered about five years ago that there was a statute that people were being prosecuted under that appeared to me to be unconstitutional under the First Amendment. A guy came to me and said, I went to trial on this case. This lady had told me that she was a grown up and then said, let's make believe that I'm a kid. And we had made, we had made believe and had sex talk back and forth on the internet. And I got arrested for that. It turned out she was a perverted justice volunteer. And I went to trial, he said, and she had edited the transcript so that the part where she was talking about her real age had been edited out. And I testified to the jury that I knew that she was actually an adult. And the judge told the jury that it didn't matter what I knew, because what was important was that she had represented herself to be a child. And I thought, that's crazy. Right. How can it possibly be that somebody is convicted of a crime where they're talking dirty to an adult, knowing that it's an adult, just because the person says in the course of the conversation, I'm a child, is right. pretending to be a child. Like role player improvisation, like right. you know, whatever it is, right. like fantasy or, you know. Right. Right. And so, and, and so I looked at the statute and I said, wow, that's really what the statute says. And then I thought, how can that possibly be the law? And I said, that can't possibly be the law. So that was the beginning of fighting that issue. That was the online solicitation of a minor statute. And I lost that case in the Court of Appeals. But then when Grant Shiner had a... So you had to lose the trial case. Well, another lawyer had lost the trial case. Okay. So I was filing a post-conviction writ, a okay. probation writ. Right. And the Court of Criminal Appeals has said that we can't raise the constitutionality, the unconstitutionality of a statute right. post-conviction. We have to do it before the trial. So I came in too late on that case, but Grant Shiner knew that, about the work that I'd been doing, and so he brought me in on Mr. Lowe's case. And we did got into that one early enough to litigate it before trial. It was in the 248th, and the judge, we took it, took the, we filed a writ. We lost on the writ. We took the writ up on appeal, and the judge stayed the trial until the appeal could be decided, and ultimately it was decided in favor of free speech, and that part of the statute was killed. So that's the first step that you started doing with the online solicitation of a minor. Right. right? And the courts told us that freedom of speech trumps your right to privacy, or so that. so that wasn't really a privacy right. case. Okay. What the 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 intuitive the part of the statute that we killed in that case was online solicitation of a minor by talking dirty to someone who represents himself to be a minor. Right. Okay, which could be a minor but might not. Intuitively we think, oh, adults shouldn't be allowed to talk dirty to minors. Right. What the Court of Criminal Appeals said in that case, however, was that the First Amendment protects adults' right to talk dirty to minors within certain bounds, as long as it's not obscene, right. and as long as it's not solicitation that is actually trying to get the minor to have sex, to actually trying to commit a crime. Because speech that is intended to result in a crime being committed, a real world crime, is not protected under the First Amendment. So that's what that case was about. Okay. But the general, the, the broader principle of the case was that we're a statute forbids speech based on its content. That is where you have to look at what the speech was in order to decide whether it violates the law or not. The statute is presumptively unconstitutional. Okay. Okay. So before we get into where that, so the online solicitation of a minor, these cases are still going on and you're still helping people on those. So the, the, yeah, we killed section 33.021B okay. of the penal code, which was the online solicitation by dirty talk. But there are a lot of people who are in prison or on probation or registering as sex offenders 
because of convictions for violating that, that statute. And those convictions should be void, right? right? But it doesn't happen automatically. So I've been going around and filing writs of habeas corpus on behalf of people who are registering as sex offenders. That's ultimately everybody who went to prison or, or was on probation for it is still registering as a sex offender. So I've been filing writs of habeas corpus on behalf of, of those who have contacted me about it and for whom it's appropriate. And, and for various reasons, some people might not want to reopen their online solicitation of minor statutes because they might be going from the fire, frying pan into the fire. Right. So we can't just go and say, okay, file a writ on behalf of everybody because some of them will be in a worse position for doing it. But uh, I've been helping people figure out whether they want to do it and then going uh, all over the state again, going and reopening their cases. TCDLA listserv has helped you do that, right? TCDLA listserv has helped me to find the, the, the cases, to find the people to find the lawyers who are defending uh, First Amendment type cases and to connect with them so that lawyers who might not otherwise have thought to make the First Amendment challenge to a statute or might not have known the best way to do it have been able to reach out to me and bring me in to sit second with them and then handle the appeal from the case. How many writs do you think you've done now? On First Amendment yeah, I mean, cases, right, I have I don't know how many. Really? And all over the state of Texas? All over. And now, over. is it even moving outside of Texas? I got an email two days ago from a lawyer in Georgia who had heard about my success in the low case. And he said, oh, can I plagiarize your brief in the low case? And I said, hell no, you cannot. I will come and I will defend this case with you. So I helped him to rewrite his, his motion challenging their statute, which is essentially the same thing as our 33.021B. And I'm going to appear pro hoc vice, and if we get argument in the uh, Supreme Court of Georgia, I'm going to go march out there and argue. Wow. And again, doing that for free. All pro bono. For the love of the game. For the love of the game. You okay. know, some guys hunt big game, some guys play golf. I hunt statutes. <laughs> well, you're helping a lot of people. How has the online solicitation gone into other cases, like the First Amendment, or, you know, not the online solicitation, but the First Amendment? How has this transgressor evolved into other statutes? So, when I killed 33.021B, I started looking around for other statutes that violated the First Amendment. 33.021C, uh, which at first glance appears to be actual solicitation, in fact forbids fantasy, explicitly forbids fantasy. Well, fantasy's got to be protected under the First Amendment. So I have several appeals going on right now in which we're challenging the constitutionality of 33.021C. The online impersonation statute, which is pretending to be somebody else online, but it's but it's actually a lot broader than that. It's using somebody else's name online with the intent to harm them. Uh -huh. So that if I post something online saying, yeah, Mark Thiessen's a jerk, uh -huh. that I have committed a felony because I have used your name without your consent with intent to harm you. Wow, and boom, that's a felony. That, that's grossly overbroad. I've got two appeals going on right now and, and hope to see some good results from those. When I had one of those, those online impersonation cases, when I filed the writ of habeas corpus, the state in Harris County looked at it and said, wow, well, you know, maybe he's right, and dismissed that case, but then refiled it as a fraudulent use of identifying information case. Now, when we think fraudulent use of identifying information, at first we think, well, identity theft, right. right? We think it's identity theft. But if you look at the statute and the way, I looked closely at the statute because of the way the state was applying it in that particular case, and I realized, wow, it can be used for this situation where somebody's using somebody's name with intent to harm them. Again, Mark Thiessen's a jerk. I have used your name without your consent with intent to harm you. I've committed fraudulent use of identifying information. So you're attacking that statute? I'm attacking that statute. Okay. Um, and, and actually, uh, Judge Case in Montgomery County held that statute to be unconstitutional, granted habeas relief on that. The state didn't appeal. And I've had a bunch of cases where I've gotten a good result in the trial court uh, or filed a good brief in the Court of Appeals and the state has dismissed to avoid, face, <laughs> to avoid facing the truth, which is that the statutes are unconstitutional. So rather than defend the statute, when I am challenging it, they're going to keep it on the books and, and they'll prosecute it and you know, maybe the next lawyer won't bother to challenge it. Exactly. But I'm trying to spread the word so that everybody knows that these statutes need to be challenged. How do you help spread the word to all, all the lawyers that don't know these? So the TCDLA listserv has been great for that. I'm a member of the Montgomery County and Fort Bend County and Harris County Criminal Lawyers Associations as well. and I've spread the word there. I have a blog. 
Okay. And I write about this stuff on my blog, so lawyers from all over the place read about it. Or sometimes someone will, will get hired on a fraudulent use of identifying information case and Google fraudulent use of identifying information Texas, and boom, my blog pops up. Yeah, your and blog they see that there's an issue. Pretty famous. What is your blog? My blog is Defending People. Okay. And I've, I've been writing it for years, more or less. I've written probably 50 some blog posts this year. In a good year, I'll write 300 or more. Uh, it, Occasionally has been named the best blog in the country by the ABA journal. What about best criminal law blog? Why do you think we're having this this mismatch of legislation and First Amendment? What's causing all of these uh, these statutes, and, you know, to be unconstitutional? I think we're getting all these unconstitutional statutes because legisla legislators are responding to panics. They're responding to panics about things going on on the internet. So there's this new technology, the internet, and bad things, <laughs> bad things can be done on the internet. You, know, you can say bad things and really hurt people's feelings. You can do more than hurt their feelings, right? right. So people will get hurt by things that happen on the, on the internet, and they'll go to their legislators and say, look, this happened to me. And the legislators will look for a solution to it. Unfortunately, when the legislators look for a solution to it, it's, it's pretty much a new world to them. And so they're not considering either the, the broader ramifications of the law they're writing. So they'll write something like the on online impersonation statute, which forbids all online criticism, effectively. And also, they're not considering the First Amendment ramifications. So they're not thinking, okay, does this law violate the First Amendment before they pass the law? So you think technology or these legislatures don't understand the technology sufficiently enough to be writing laws about it? I, th I think they... I don't think that saying they don't understand the technology is really the right way to put it. I think they don't understand the culture okay. of the internet well enough to be writing laws. How should we start writing, or how would you suggest the legislature write future uh, laws involving the internet, technology, the fast evolving pace of technology? I talked to Senator Huffman's uh, office, this legislative session, about a law that she was trying to write to fix the online solicitation of a minor statute. And I talked about what actually needed to be done so that the statute would, would probably, and I'm not, yeah, not going to put my stamp of approval on it until I've had a chance to beat on it with an actual client for a while, but would probably pass constitutional muster. And in that case, what, uh, Huffman, what Senator Huffman did, uh, and which, which passed and which I think is probably going to hold up, was to write a law that forbade speech with minors with the intent that a specific sex crime with a minor be committed, which makes all the difference in the world, right? Right? Because we can we can we can't intend for crimes to be committed and then do something about it, right? right. And, you know, we have attempt statutes, we have conspiracy statutes. All of those pass muster, and so this is closer to what could actually what can actually be forbidden. Uh, it also makes it more difficult for the for the prosecutors to prove. Right, right. So the easier it is for prosecutors to prove, the less likely it is to be constitutional. Right. All right. But you're willing to help these senators understand the culture, understand the technology, help you in, and you understand the law, help sure. in writing an, an effective. Sure. I, I, I am willing to help the legislature understand these things and write laws that might pass constitutional muster. But there are some lines that they'd like to cross that just can't be crossed. Okay. Not, a, not with the state of First Amendment law as it is now. Let me ask you, where do you see the, the future of First Amendment law? I think that the, the next big fight is going to be over the, I think the next big fight in First Amendment law is going to be over whether privacy can trump the First Amendment, whether privacy trumps free speech. The Texas legislature passed a statute over my objection this year uh, outlawing revenge porn, which is the publication of intimate images of a romantic partner without that romantic partner's consent or former romantic. So, so boyfriend, girlfriend, they break up. Boyfriend has pictures that he made of him and the girlfriend having sex. He publishes them online with the intent to, to harm her, to embarrass her, to humiliate her. Uh, the legislature passed a law to <coughs> forbid that. And so the, the advocates of that say, well, look, this protects the, the person, the woman's privacy, the woman in our hypothetical, although statistics show that it's more often committed by women than by men. So in our hypothetical, that they're saying it protects the woman's privacy. Well, privacy never has trumped the First Amendment. Now, they might want it to trump the First Amendment. They might want an exception to the First Amendment for violations of privacy. 
And at first blush, that may seem appealing to us as well. We might say, oh yeah, sure, I think that our privacy ought to trump the First Amendment. Right. People shouldn't be able to talk about us in violation of our privacy. But all news, all criticism, potentially violates somebody's privacy, right. right? Any news story about somebody who doesn't want to be written about violates that person's privacy. Are we going to allow people to control everything that is said and, and uh, written and published about them? Obviously, we're not going to do that. So then the question is, can we draw a category narrow enough to cover the revenge porn, the, the malicious publication of the, of the intimate images, without risking the rest of the, the big old basket of, of free speech that we have right. that might violate other people's privacy? Because I think you agree. Clearly, we don't want people going out there, sending out these images maliciously. You can't just sit quiet, because what happens if you just sit quiet and you know, let the legislature trump on our First Amendment rights. Right, right, right. So we can't just keep our mouths shut and let you know, and say, okay, right, revenge porn sucks. Right. So it's okay for you to pass a law criminalizing revenge porn, because that's just a foot in the door. That's once we allow the legislature to violate our free speech rights in that little way by criminalizing that little thing, then it gives them permission to go even farther, and they're going to push even farther and farther and farther. There's a, uh, a councilman in Frederick, Maryland, who a newspaper wrote some articles that were unfavorable to him. Mm -hmm. And he wrote the newspaper an article saying, uh, a letter, he wrote the newspaper an article, a letter saying, you don't have my permission to use my name. If you use my name without my permission anymore, I'm going to sue you. So this is what, in fact, we're dealing with, right. is people in power who think that they have the right to control what is said about them. And ultimately, we want to preserve free speech so that we have the right to speak truth to power. Now, you know, is, is, Revenge porn speaking truth to power? Uh, often probably not. But if we give the government the power to forbid revenge porn, then what do they get along with that and what are they going to take next? Right. Is truth still the ultimate defense? I mean, you could say, I took these pictures, you did these sex acts, truth is the defense. Nope. No. Nope. Nope. Not under the revenge porn statute. It's the truth is not a defense. Right. In fact, you know, because we're talking about actual photographs, truth at least arguably, is part of the, the state's proof that they have to show that the pictures actually were pictures of the complainant, that they're true pictures of the complainant. Okay. So out of all this amazing work, why aren't you here getting, and you're not here getting the, the award for badass constitutional warrior of the year. You're getting it for pro bono lawyer of the year. How does all of this amazing constitutional work that's even starting to creep across the nation how, do you get in this, how are we getting all this pro bono? Are you telling me you're doing all this work for free? I'm not doing all of this work for free, but I'm doing a whole lot of it for free, and I will do it all for free if I need to. Uh, this is my recreation. This is my sport. And, you know, I like to kill statutes. And, and so you know, if somebody comes to me and says, hey, I've got a client, and he's charged with this, and I know you're the guy who knows how to fight this statute, but he doesn't have any money left to pay you anything, and I haven't been paid enough to, to be able to pay you anything, what can you do for me? I'll say, yeah, I'll help you with it. Yeah, whatever the client can afford. And a lot of that often is low bono or pro bono. Um, generally, I'll, you know, the lawyer is able to come up with something for my airfare if I have to come out and, and argue the, uh, the case. But for the most part, it's just for love of the game, just because I love to do it. So when a 22-year-old intern comes and says, Mark Bennett, you know, are you having fun quashing, attacking all this legislature? Are you having fun at your job every day? I am having fun at my job every day. I wouldn't be doing so much of it for free if I weren't loving it so much. That's fantastic, Mark. Thank you for all of your Thanks. work. Thanks for fighting for all of us. Thanks, Mark.